Here we go. Welcome everyone to VO Booth Besties. We're here to help working voice actors get your most important questions answered by industry pros who know. Uh, each week we have a new topic and a guest speaker who is an expert on that topic. To stay updated on all things VOBB, you can swing by our website, boothbesties.com, and sign up for our weekly newsletter. And join us in the VO Booth Besties Facebook group as well. Now, without further ado, let's meet our guest. Over to you, AB. Except I'm not quite ready. Uh, That's all right. We'll just, we'll flip flop. I'll take it. You take it. Uh, that sounds good. After a 36 year career in radio, David H. Lawrence, the 17th, moved to television and has been seen in many series, is best known for the creepy, evil puppet master, Eric Doyle, on NBC's smash hit Heroes, which I love. His film career includes on-camera and VO work on Cars 3, Straight Outta Compton, Men in Black 3, Pizza Man, The Changeling, The Hulk, Iron Man, Percy Jackson, Unstoppable, Too Big to Fail, A Special Relationship, and countless others. He helps actors create their own voiceover careers with his award-winning VOHeroes.com training program, both online and and in person in LA. David has been Backstage Reader's Choice for Favorite VO Teacher and Favorite VO Demo Producer for four years in a row now. Congratulations, sir. Lawrence created the best-selling industry standard rehearsal pro app for actors and VO talent, giving them a digital rehearsal studio space right in their pocket. On radio, David's shows have been heard on over 300 stations and both XM and Sirius Satellite Radio. Lawrence was at the forefront of the podcasting revolution, which is very cool. Having delivered daily real audio and MP3 podcasts via email from the early 19, well, mid 1990s, 95. Lawrence has voiced over 200 audiobooks and teaches specialized courses in audiobook production with a concentration on ACX and audible work and teaches an ACM masterclass, which is pretty much what we're focusing on today. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to read that whole thing verbatim. I would have sent you like two sentences oh, I, so that we didn't. I didn't. I whittled oh, it good. down. Okay. Because there was so much there. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> hi. So, hi. Okay. So, having heard all of that, NJ, are you going to, or do I start? I guess I'm starting. You go ahead. Ooh. We flopped. All right. David. To say that your career has been prolific, that's an understatement, right? Like you are all over the place. Uh, but before we dive in, let's start with the 17th. Tell us the story oh. behind that. Oh, yeah. So I, I generated this whole big, long, multi-screen long response when fans would say, what's up with the 17, you know, and it goes back to the mid 1500s and my Scottish roots and my family being, you know, the first, uh, uh, you know, fast food magnets in the world. They had a, a huge chain of haggis fast food stands that you drive your cart through. Uh, and it just got better from there. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that everybody in SAG-AFTRA has to have a very, as it has to have a unique name. And when I got to SAG-AFTRA uh, and I had my IMDb page open, once I got qualified to be in the union, they said, so what do you want your name to be? It can't be David Lawrence. It can't be David H. Lawrence. And um, I didn't want it to be D.H. Lawrence. And I had IMDb open and I was the 17th David Lawrence on IMDb. And my it had the Roman numerals in the, the parentheses that they put in there. If you're I'm sure, Jen, you're probably uh, one of a number of people. Yeah. So. Um, so I just as a, you know, we were going through all the names with the lady on the phone at SAG after a no, 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 we got one of those already. No. And uh, so finally, just as a joke, I said, OK, OK, what about and I read it right off the screen. David H. Lawrence, the 17th. And she goes, great. Click. <laughs> so it's turned out OK. <laughs> that is a really fun story. I mean, is it? Not okay. everybody gets to come up with a cool name like that, right? Oh, everybody so. has to come up with a cool name like that. I mean, that's, you know, you if you're already, like if there was another Ms. Bake in, in the, I'm sure there isn't, you know. Probably not. No. Uh, not spelled like Alicia anyway. Yeah, you'd have to, yeah, certainly with the spelling. Yeah, and then you could do the spelling that way. And I didn't want to do like D-A-Y-V-A-D-V-I-D and spend yeah. the rest of my life 
correcting people on how to spell my name. So yeah, that's what happened. So that's a fun story, David. It's definitely a way to stand out for sure. Um, so you do both on-camera work and voiceover work. How did you find yourself in the acting world? How did that come about? So uh, I just did a podcast episode about this the other day, Second Acts in Life. Um, I did not become an on-camera actor uh, until my late 40s, and I didn't get my first gig until I turned after I turned 50. And it's a story that, you know, when I was a kid, I was, I had a, a transistor radio. And for those of you who don't know what that is, look it up. I had a transistor radio under my pillow listening to distant radio stations. And I just fell in love with radio in general. I made up all kinds of stories in my head about how DJs did their work and how weather casters knew what the weather was going to be. And as a child, that was a lovely world to live in. I was disabused of my notions as I grew older. Um, but I really loved radio, and I got into radio first, and then radio became kind of this cesspool of a business in the late 90s, early 2000s with consolidation. And I was doing syndicated radio, and that was even worse. So I... Um, I thought to myself, self, you've always wanted to go on television and see what this beautiful face and this amazing physique could do on camera. Why not? And so I did. I moved out here in 2003 and um, did my training and resisted auditioning until I felt I, I had enough to go into the room and be confident. And then the first the first gig I got was Heroes. Wow. That's, yeah. that's pretty impressive. I was... Definitely a, am definitely a fan of that show myself. It was one of the first shows I think my husband and I ever like binge watched, you know, because I think that was when we stumbled across it, it was already online, you know, but yep. um, so tell me out after that, what drew you to audiobooks? Well, audiobooks preceded that. I was doing audiobooks oh. in the late, late 80s. Um, I lived in Washington, D.C. and the Library of Congress is right there. And so I did work for a number of different organizations that did audiobooks. It wasn't anywhere close to being the kind of world that it is today, where, mm -hmm. you know, we're all used to doing our own production. Some of us come from radio, some of us don't, but all of us are producing our own auditions every day of the week. And the notion for me that there was an opportunity with ACX to not only narrate the audiobook, but have control over the quality of it and the editing and the production of it actually was something I was drawn to rather than repelled by. And I know there are people who like look at the production side of an audiobook and go, no, no, get away from me, you beast, you know? And I think part of that is because it is a much larger proposition than any other form of voiceover that we undertake. And yet, I would submit to you that it is very much a lather, rinse, repeat process when you're doing, when you're thinking about the the technical side of it, the editing side of it, the production side of it, etc. Um, to me, it is the the pursuit of voiceover that gives me the most freedom that gives me the most latitude and lets me be an actor. It's really hard to uh, come up sometimes with the juiciness of an audiobook when you're, you know, auditioning for uh, hemorrhoid cream. It just, it's not the same. Can be, give but that. not all. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so audio hemorrhoid in the same sentence is a bit, I don't know. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. Uh, it's all right. Uh, it's Thursday. So, you know, one one mention of hemorrhoid is required here in the state of California. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So and, and audiobooks, um, you know, uh, has changed so much since uh, Audible created ACX and uh, for the good and for the bad. And um it's just a, a larger set of details. And I would think that when I saw your reaction, Jen, uh, that it was uh, uh, just one of, of uh, rejection. No, not going to happen. And I get that. I understand that. And I think one of the things that the ACX Masterclass tries to do is show you that you can actually get some joy out of the process rather than 
the awful foreshadowing of a slog in your future. Is that kind of what you think audiobooks? I mean, I don't know if you do audiobooks or and you hate them or you don't, don't do audiobooks. You don't do audiobooks. I don't because the the process seems very daunting to me. Ah. It's a marathon. Then, then I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> yeah, me too. I um I do occasionally do an audiobook. I think NJ's done a couple in the last year, right? Like I find that audiobooks for me um, it's not about the, I don't mind the editing. In fact, the one I'm doing right now, she's paying an editor, which oh. feels really weird to me because I keep going in and editing it myself because I want control over how it sounds, um, which is why it's taking me longer. <laughs> but mm. for me, it's like, I know I have to do 26 chapters of this. Like, I'm going to have to stick with the same project for 26 chapters. That That feels, that's the part that feels overwhelming and daunting. Like, I'd rather type a project, finish it up in a day, send it off and move on to the next thing. I sure. think that's a, that's an ADHD thing for me. Well, no, no, um, hold on. Don't, don't, don't sell yourself short. That's, <laughs> that's our normal workflow, right? Yeah. We get anywhere between zero and 20 auditions a day. And they're all little tiny islands that we conquer. And I would submit to you that an audiobooks workflow is similar. It just happens over a series of days. And, you know, I think people look at the final product and they go, oh, my God, that must have been awful. That must. Oh, I, who could sit there for and think about it? They had to do multiple takes. Um, OK, well, that's one way of looking at it. Um, one of the things that you learn as an audiobook narrator uh, is that you don't do multiple takes. You just do pickups and you do them on the fly. And so uh, it's a little bit different from auditioning for, again, a commercial or an IVR project where you're doing maybe a number of takes to get to the one that you want, as few as possible, everybody. Um, but um, with with audiobooks, you have to have the the absolute confidence in your storytelling ability to be able to notice that you said the word Tuesday instead of Thursday in the sentence of, all right, I'll see you Thursday. Um, and then do a pickup immediately. And part of the process that I created to make this palatable was something that got you and kept you on that road without the 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 stopping and starting of uh, punch and roll or of straight recording and then going back and listening for your dog clicker or whatever, whatever process that you're using that you think is clever and useful. Um, I created a process that relies on a behavior of audacity uh, called the stair step method. That is, as far as I know, the most efficient and least likely to pull you out of storyteller mode of any way of narrating. And I found that a very famous uh, a narrator, someone who's won multiple Audis, does a very similar process and has for decades. And I was that like made me happy because I, I've been attacked. My, my, my method has been called snake oil. And I just know that's not true. And when I found out that that uh, this narrator uh, does this, I was like, oh, good. And now I can stop worrying about being validated about what I know is right. Mm -hmm. so yeah well and it's interesting talking. no that's good i i think that too often in the industry we have a mindset that there's one way to do things and that our way is the only way and um i i mean it really pisses off those of us who know that our way is the only way man right I'm telling you. right <sighs> um so there's a lot of people in our group who probably haven't ever done an audiobook they might not know anything about acx um, I haven't even logged in to ACX in probably more than a year. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the platform as it is now and being successful there. Yeah. So it's kind of like Tinder for rights holders and narrators, um, although way. there's no swiping that's going on. Um, and there's also no uh, no uh, running out on your date, not paying for dinner. So that's kind of nice. Um, it is a platform that was created specifically for matching up uh, rights holders and their titles, authors, publishers, trusts, you know, who have titles that need to be narrated into audiobooks with people who can do that, with, with people like us. And it wasn't a, uh, a virtuous thing. You know, when Amazon bought Audible, 
they looked at the number of of Kindle books that had not yet been turned into audiobooks and they thought, damn, we need to develop a gorgeous platform to do this. And so they did. And so, and it was all about the money, exactly. Um, so uh, you know, ACX was created so that Amazon would have more stuff to sell. And that's fine. That's just great. I was one of the original. I think there were 18 of us that started as the first Audible approved producers. I knew I knew people at ACX. I knew people, uh, Beth and I had worked a long time when she was the vice president of Audible. And uh, they invited me to be one of the first ones on the platform. And it was a very different uh, process, approach. Um, I was still using Pro Tools. And, you know, it was it was um, it was interesting. But the the notion that uh, ACX is as cool and as nice and as wonderful as it is, I remember I literally moments after I'd done my first few books on ACX, I was on a panel for SAG-AFTRA of audiobook narrators. And the traditional audiobook narrators that were sitting next to me were so dismissive of the notion of royalty share and what I had at the time kind of termed hybrid stipends where I was asking without ACX paying for it, I was asking rights holders, Hey, if you want me to do this, I'm going to need some money up front. And we talked that for the longest time uh, in the ACX masterclass. And now they have royalty share plus they actually made it official. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a royalty share for me, revenue split. That's kind of a, a standard and has been for decades in the world of dot com. So I was really comfortable with that so much about this is good and yes there are some things that are just really freaking annoying about it but what we try to do with the acx masterclass is make all of that very straightforward very systematic uh while at the same time appealing to both halves of your brain the creative side the the systematic side um yeah did i answer so your question yeah, so I want to jump in and let's stay in that vein because you're you're coming right into what I want to talk about. So David, you and I met in Orlando at the Wovo conference and had a wonderful meal together and I just enjoyed you so much and I I just want to say personally I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Um Thank you. You got lots of knowledge. Um, so I have recorded audiobooks with both Find Away Voices, which I know that's not a thing anymore, and ACX, so I've you know been part of both. So uh, I finished uh, recently a nonfiction book on ACX. So you brought up uh, the royalty share, royalty share, all the things, right? So for me, to this point, I have only done books where I have been paid for a per finished hour. I don't do, I have not done any royalty share, any of the rev, you know, all that. So I was wondering if you could kind of explain to our listeners if, again, maybe they don't really understand the nuts and bolts of that, the nuance of, of these different payment methods through yep. ACX. Sure. So ACX has their own names for everything. Uh, you know, the, the, the grand tradition of audiobook narration payment processes is called per finished hour. Mm -hmm. And ACX calls that pay for production. And it's a one-time payment that you get paid based on the length of the finished book on a per hour basis. And I'm on the SAG-AFTRA audiobook narrators uh, steering committee. And we're very, very revered within the union for our tenacity when it comes to the individual contracts that we've created. So ACX is actually covered by union contract if you have anybody who's watching or listening that's union. Um, however, it doesn't matter if you're union or not. Anybody, union or non-union, can take any project without worrying about whether or not it, it falls under a particular contract or qualifies for uh, 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 pension and health or, or uh, health and retirement. And uh, so to, to just answer your question directly, per finished hour is what the, the, the venerable world of audiobooks knows. Royalty share is this new uh, kind of weird, even after you know 15 years, it's still like this, what are you talking about? And basically, per finished hour, you get paid flat once, that's it, you're done. Right. Uh, and that's the way it's always been. And royalty share is, as the book sells, you get 20%, and the author gets 20% of whatever 
Audible or whatever the retailer was collects for that particular copy of the book, which can vary all over the place from a few pennies or nothing if it's on sale for a special weekend right. to uh, quite a bit of money, depending upon how long the book is. And the fear at the very beginning was, oh, that's going to there. That's the race to the bottom. They're going to they're going to rip us off. We're going to do all this work. We're going to make no money. And uh, it depends because, you know, the, the dirty little secret is if you know how to pick your projects and uh, admittedly, it's gotten a lot harder with the sort of scam level that's on ACX now because no, there's no barriers to entry. Yep. Anybody can go on there and say they're a narrator. <laughs> Should they go anywhere near a microphone? Not most of them. Um, and anybody can go on there and say that they're a rights holder or an author or a publisher. And so there's a level of scam that wasn't there when we first started. But I can tell you, my experience has been absolutely gorgeous. And I want to try and help recreate that for my students and clients. My uh, sort of library of work pays my mortgage every month. And it does so without me doing any additional work than the work that I did when I narrated the book. Now, is that going to be everybody's experience? Not even close. I mean, there are people well, that are going to go. Yeah, go the ahead. The thing to understand with that is with per finished hour, and this is my experience, though limited, but but per finished hour, the 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 rights holder, the author, they're coming to the table. They're ready to pay. Um, and then it's on them. That's my thing, and I that I I wanted to also kind of tie into what you're saying. It feels like when you do one of these shared, you know, when the book sells, now we're both having to promote the book, right? Like, and maybe I, I mean, you know, that's, that's what it feels I, like. I want, I I certainly counsel my clients to help that happen because it increases your income as well. Right, right. And but when we're finished hour. I get paid my flat rate and then it's on them to sell the book. And, you know, like I need to be comfortable with what I charged and then be able to walk away. But with the mixed one, they don't have to come to the table with anything, but then you both maybe have to have a plan in place that you would promote the book. So you both make money, right? Yeah. I don't think those are the two biggest things to worry about is in the okay. difference between per finished hour and royalty share. There's a lot of things to consider and note that the calculus is going on on the rights holders side as well. You know, this book is going to sell well. I don't want to do royalty share. No, I want the money. Good point. So, so, you know, it becomes a judgment call on both of your parts and a remembrance that you're an artist and that you need to decide for yourself what projects you want to be involved with, what projects you even want to pursue how you want to pursue those. I've got a client right now who's done, I think, 13 books at this point, made a good deal of money. And he's now going to be doing an audiobook as a favor to his cousin who wrote a book. And he has the choice and the, the power to be able to do that. You know, we've all done favors for people because we have this gift that we've been given. And to be able to do that and to do it and say, oh, yeah, it's going to be a big project, but it's like me building a chair for your birthday. You know, I, I know I can go into the workshop and I know how to use a lathe and a chisel and a screwdriver. And I know I can put this all together. I don't even know if those tools are required to make a chair, but I, I do know what it takes to make an audio book. And what I want is to teach people how to fish. You know, I yeah. want to give them the yeah. ability and to do it in a way where they really enjoy it, you know, so... Yeah. I love that. So with that being said, when someone is considering getting into narrating audiobooks, just the lathe and the hammer uh, that they need, what are some what are some uh, requirements, some some tools that not only apply to voice actors, but really specifically for narrators trying to do ACX? What are some requirements that people need to be aware of? So the good news is if you're doing voiceover already, you likely have everything you need, right? You, your microphone's going to be fine. <clears throat> your computer's going to be fine. You have a, a digital audio workstation that you're using. Um, I am a little bit of a heretic when it comes to all this. I don't want my clients spending thousands of dollars to get prepared for something that doesn't require that level of, of, of effort. And I'm a cheap bastard. 
I'm I'm uh, I'm now sending letters to the SAG after and uh, the SAG and the after uh, retirement funds going, where's my money? You know, so uh, I happen to use a microphone in my in my audio studio that uh, people are horrified by uh, some some people are horrified by. On the other hand, uh, people who listen to my audiobooks and listen to the voiceover work that I've done for people, you know, uh, they don't know what kind of microphone I have. And it happens to be an Audio-Technica AT2020 USB+. Plus. And I found this microphone. It was a unicorn for me. I have a Neumann U87 and I have a, a an MKH416 sitting on the shelf in their oak boxes. I haven't opened them in a few years. Um, you know, it it happens to be something that lowers the level of uh, of effort that you need to see if it's something that you want to do. At the same time, the stair step method is based on audacity, which is free. Um, all of this is in service of one big, huge showstopper. If you don't get it right, and that is, as you know, the technical requirements for Audible. Um, and so we, uh, for a long time, we're teaching. Uh, using a piece of software that was developed for podcasts way back in the day called the Levelator, and then going back in and and uh, peak normalizing to minus three. But then when most of our people are Mac users, and <clears throat> a few years ago, um, the new version of Mac OS jumped from 32-bit to 64-bit, and the Levelator stopped working. So I got together with a friend of mine. I was complaining to him one day, I got to find a new way to do this. I want to make it easy. I want to make it drag and drop. And he goes, what's the problem? So I told him and he goes, well, let's just build a new piece of software that, I mean, how hard can this be? And Dave Mark, who's been a friend of mine for a long, long time, he and I got together and to my specifications bespoke, he coded a, an app called Audio Cupcake. And Audio Cupcake is a drag and drop a uh, piece of software <clears throat> where you take your finished WAV file, drag it onto it, and it creates an MP3 file that perfectly meets Audible's wow. requirements in one stroke. You don't have to worry about plugins. You don't have to worry about filters. Uh, you know, as they say, come for the RMS, stay for the MP3. Um, you know, I never, by the way, I never wear literate clothing when I do these I don't. I just don't. I have a rule about it. But today, it just felt right. And so uh, Audio Cupcake, and we give it to all of our students for free. It's it's only 20 bucks if you have to pay for it. But uh, we give it to all of our students for free. It's part of the process. And it's one of those things that cuts out an irritant. Yes. You know, you either have to have a chain set up or you have to have plugins that you know what the settings are going to be in every time. Sometimes you have to like finagle it. Well, we don't you don't have to finagle it. And so if you can create the less friction you have in this process, the more attention you can pay to being a great performer and the more projects you can get done in the same amount of time to build that library that kicks off cash if you're doing royalty share or royalty share plus or bring you her finished hour work. So that the is fantastic. Yeah, the, the technical requirements become a repeatable, solved mm -hmm. math problem as opposed to, oh, God, can I just audition for a commercial? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I do. So we're going to get into um, what you were talking about and more of the acting side in that. But um, we have a question from uh, one of our viewers. It's uh, from Terry Briscoe. He asked, David, have you ever had a rights holder take your narration and use it on other platforms such as YouTube videos? And are there protections on ACX for such instances? Um, it's the... First of all, it's the wrong question to ask. I don't mean to be a, okay. a negative Nelly, but you're doing a work for hire. So it doesn't matter. You don't own any rights to this. You don't own any, you don't, you, they can do whatever they want with it. They can even not release it. You know, it's not yeah. your, it's not up to you. Um, in fact, I want them to do other things with it. You know, uh, we show people how to create audiobook trailers, which are part and parcel of the promotion process. Um, 
for a book, just like, you know, you see commercials on television all the time for films and for television shows, you see promos and you'll occasionally see a very serious, earnestly voiced commercial for a new Lee Childs book, you know, or a new Tom Clancy book, you know, um, what they do with your work in the end is uh, nothing you have any say in. So, yes, they've done that. And for the most part, I've wanted them to do that. And I've done events with them. I've done I want to do promotions with them. I don't look at this as like they're taking advantage of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm building my legend every day of my life. And the way I treat my clients and the way I treat my students, I I want that to be built. And I want the product that I produce to be it promoted however my client wants it promoted. Now, if they take your voice and they drop it onto a large language model and they model it against, you know, AI for synthetic voices, okay, that's a line that, that can't be crossed. And, and I get that. But the notion of them using your content to serialize their book, you know, it's their book. It's their baby. It's their IP. So I think this is a great, gosh, and actually I, so I am actually glad Terry asked this, even though we're kind of twisting it on its head. And I think this is a, a voice over genre um, differentiation, because when you do an audio book, the way we're talking about it, it's always going to be in perpetuity, you know, we hear that in perpetuity. So that's just done. Like that's a given. It is theirs. Well, they own it. How, how are you like, help us. Little wrinkle. Okay. With royalty share, the contract is seven years. Oh, okay. And so at the end of the seven years, the rights holder has the choice of saying, thank you very much. I appreciate the first seven years. See you later. Um, or continuing on. And so there is a limited life to the amount of money that you're going to make from that, but the rights don't change. And the this notion of it being work for hire is no different from any other category of work. Okay. You know, if you're doing IVR, company depends on the number of callers, you know, that, that hear your messages. If you're doing a commercial, it depends on how many channels and platforms they put it on. You know, it's it's up to them. And in the case of union covered work, well, if they use it more, you're going to get paid more. In the case of royalty share or royalty share plus, if they sell more, if you can help it sell more, you're going to be paid more. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, last question I have, and then I'm going to turn it over to JT, um, because this came to my attention and you've been talking about the union several times. And <clears throat> one of the audio books that I did would technically qualify me to join SAG. However, um, I was hoping you can kind of speak to you need to kind of figure that out on the front end, right? There, There's a little negotiation that needs to happen on the front end. Can you talk about that? What kind of negotiation are you referring meaning, to? Meaning that um, the way I read it was that I had to um, have the rights holder, like there had to be an agreement where we were trying to get with the paymaster. And I don't know, it seemed like some stuff had to be done before finishing the book that it had to be, I'm not even talking straight. Help I understand me. what you're saying though. I'll, help let me help me. you out here. So <laughs> first of all, yeah, there's a couple of moving parts that need to move in the right order. And that is that when the offer is made, if the project as the rights holder offers it to you on ACX qualifies either with a per finished hour pay for production project of $250 per hour or more, or a royalty share plus project of $100 per finished hour on the plus part or more, a little button will light up on the project that says, accept with AFTRA H&R. You have to accept it at that point under those conditions to be able to go ahead and do that. And the cool thing is, this was, this was a couple of years ago, this came up in a meeting. Remember when everybody wanted to get into the union and they were told, oh, just do a web series. I don't know if you remember this, but at the time in the late 2000s, People wanted, because they were merging, people wanted to get into the union. They wanted to get in before the merger. They wanted to take advantage of that. And everybody's like, oh, do a web series. Used to be that that it was a hard thing to get somebody into the union because you had to prove that nobody in the union couldn't do what this actor that you were trying to get into the union could do. And, and you know, casting directors were, um, were, were told, don't do this unless it's absolutely necessary. You had to send a letter. Taft Hartleying into the union. Those of you that have been union members for a long time will remember this. And then everything shifted. 
And it was like, no, we want as many people in the union as we can get. We want that $3,000, you know? So they were like, do a web series. So people were writing these one episode web series and they were getting their friends together and they would go down to the, the, the union building on, on Wilshire and they would go, who all's in your thing? We'll get them all in the union, you know? Five people in the cast, that's $15,000. Great. So, um, but now the most direct path to becoming a member, if you don't qualify with any other type of project, is to get one union coverable audiobook. And you just tell them, here's my audiobook, and you're in. So it's a, a lower lift. It's a it's an easier path to do it. Um, but you have to do things in the right order. You you um, and how you get paid, whether it's through a paymaster or directly from the rights holder via Zelle, that's not something that's a union requirement. But what is a union requirement is making sure that all the contributions that are supposed to be made are made properly. And that's where a paymaster like Noah at Skywire, I love him. Oh my God, do I love him? Um, comes in because he takes care of all that stuff for next to nothing. So it's great. All right, AB, we're just past the half hour mark. Jump in here. Perfect. This is the perfect time to talk about why I love my Studio Bricks booth. And I feel like in previous episodes, I have covered all of the reasons, but one. And that is because I can come out here and shut the door and I can shut away the noise of the world and forget I have children. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it is, it really does block the external sound from getting in. And it gives me a lovely sound treated space to record in. And it takes all of the frustration out of my need to have a place to record. Now, previous to this, people who have, I've known for a while, I had built a custom booth in the corner of my um, upstairs playroom. Like I, I built it in, we put a door, we soundproofed it, insulated it, it was great. And I was getting um, minus 60 dB consistently. I was really excited. It was fabulous. Then my neighbor cut down all the trees between our houses. And I realized that my, what I thought was a perfectly sound treated space had this beautiful buffer of trees that was blocking the sound from the rest of the neighborhood from getting into my audio. And um, I had to cancel a massive session with a big client and um, it was a really big deal. And I went out and ordered the Studio Bricks booth that day. Yeah, Chris McGinnis in the chat, he says, instead of Calgon, it's Studio Bricks, take me away. <laughs> yes, yes, this is like my... I just get a minute and it's silent and I can sit here and then I'll turn around. <laughs> Literally yesterday, my 12 year old, there's a door. You can't really let's see if you can see this, this big door right here. My 12 year old is just, I'm recording and I'm focused. And I turn around and she's just there like this at the door. And I'm like, okay, I need a curtain for my door. But I love Studio Bricks. If you're interested, check them out. They're really great. And um, we can roll right back into the next section of our. Can I add my my. That's a great. I have a five and a half by a four and a half, and and I it's triple walled, and uh, I didn't need one until the building next door was undergoing renovation. And yeah, it's great. Love studio book uh, studio bricks. Yeah, they're building a neighborhood. There's a creek behind my house and woods. And on the other side of that, they're building a neighborhood. And you would not believe how much noise those land mover trucks make, you know, like so much noise. I'm like, can we just get to the hammering, please? Because the vibrations, but <clears throat> I could, I was able to record in here. I, it didn't stop me from doing my job. So Great. no more whining about leaf blowers. Let's just all have a studio bricks in a perfect world, <laughs> in a perfect, perfect world. Right. So JT. Yep. Um, I want to transition a little bit and talk about the performance aspect of narrating an audiobook mm -hmm. because it is so much different than any other genre that we do. Um, and they're within the audiobook world, there are so many different genres. How do you know, like, how do you decide which genres are right for you? Uh, I would question whether you need to. You okay. know, I don't think we can all safely predict what 
is on our plate in the future and what we'll be good at and what we won't be good at. We may gain experience as to what we like and what we don't like and what we're good at and what we don't. Like when I first came to LA to be on camera, I thought the only thing that anybody's ever going to hire me for is uh, to be a goofy uncle that you want to keep the kids away from. Uh, you know, you don't want to leave them with him when you're going off to the movies, you know, the frat boy that never grew up, I'd be doing nothing but sitcoms. Right. Um, creepy evil villain was not on my bingo card. And, um, and I, and it was a, a really interesting surprise. And then there are, are, you know, genres of books that I, I, I could have predicted that I wanted to do and what I liked doing. And then there were things that there's no way in hell, if you'd given me the scenario, I would have said, sure. Uh, I've narrated a, a series of New York times bestsellers uh, where the protagonist is a 27-year-old Buffalo, New York native, Irish-American, Harvard-educated police detective who is a woman. And when okay. I was booked, you know, because like diversity, right? So when I was booked, uh, you know, this was through Penguin Random House, I called them and I said, did you make a mistake here? Did you mean to, did you mean to send this to like, you know, Hillary Huber or, you know, this, uh, me? Oh yeah. We loved how you did her. We love how you, you, you put her out there, you know, and usually I will give some gross um, advice to my clients who are worried about gender and, and age when it comes to, you know, sort of designing voices and say, okay, if you just on the highest level for kids and for women, raise your pitch a little bit and be curious about everything. For guys, lower your pitch a little bit and become the total asshole. <laughs> that's that's the advice that I give to start. And somehow Absalom, which was the, the character's name, came out a little bit deeper than my voice and a little bit more studied. It's just the way the text, which by the way, is all you need. The words do the heavy lifting. There's an author that has worked on this project sometimes for the majority of their lives, not just the last 15, 20 minutes like we do with some auditions. They've worked on this and they've honed this and they've refined this. And the subtext, the text, the, the arcs in the story, these are things that AI is going to have a real trouble getting right. And you don't have to have that kind of trouble if you just give yourself those options. Um, so I could talk about this for days. So stop me because it's like, and once you start doing this kind of work, watch the rest of your work get even better because you're going to go, Oh, maybe I could do that with that Calgon spot. Maybe I could, uh, you know, maybe I could be a little bit more um daring in my in my chances that I take with uh with that documentary narration piece that I'm auditioning for that explainer video you know we tend to fall into these very comfortable patterns when we go into some of us when we go into voiceover mode and I'm always really protective of the reality of the character the re you know even if the character is trying to figure out what to serve for dinner it's still a story that you're telling and it's still a character that you're creating and it's still the fun that you can have in this we've cre we we've selected the this business this this lifestyle this pursuit to the detriment of our relationships with our families and our close <laughs> friends and having to explain this around the holidays so don't you want to be on that saturday night live why don't you sign up for that yeah. Okay, mom. Thanks. I appreciate it. You know, you think you're right. Yeah, let's do that. So, you know, we forget sometimes why we do this, what we do, how we do it, because we get into this rut. You know, we look at it as this laundry list, this checkbox list of auditions that we have to get done before dinner or that we will get to as soon as we get the kids to bed or whatever it is. And it becomes mechanical as opposed to aesthetic. And one of the joys of my life is remembering on a regular basis, the artwork. You know, when I teach, I teach with four major pillars, the art, the science, the commerce, and the mindset. So the work we do, like 
you know, the business that we build, the technology that we use and the science that we use, we have to use, and the mindset that we need to keep ourselves aware of to not want to kill ourselves for making this decision to be in this business, right? And the art is almost all, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got it. I, I know how to do commercials. I mean, if there's one thing that I hear when people come to me is like, listen, I've been doing this a long time. I know what I'm doing. Okay, great. Let me let me offer you just a, a maybe a, a slight little turn of the screw that might help the factory run better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you talked about um, the character being a woman mm -hmm. in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. Irish. Buffalo. Buffalo. Oh, Buffalo, sorry. <laughs> Which is very different from Brooklyn. Um, sure do you recommend that people take acting classes or dialect classes or not unless they come across something like this? So in that particular case, I think one of the other reasons that they booked me was from, from Cleveland and all around the, the Great Lakes. It's kind of a similar, you know, we park our car in the driveways, you know, so we have that, you know, it, it was it was pretty easy for me to create the other characters, you know, the cops that were you know, on the take and, and all that. But here's what I say about that. Don't worry so much about it. If you're really good at accents and dialects, great. If you're not, that's okay too. There are lots and lots of very successful narrators who I wouldn't put in the category of, you know, uh, uh, accent hounds. And then there are those who are really good at it so good at it that it can become distracting like you were in the story and then all of a sudden they came up with their southern mongolian character who was so dead on and you know because you grew up throat singing in southern mongolia and you know what the oh my god they got to say and it's like wait wait did, did they kill that guy did, wait, wait what happened you know i i think that acting classes are really helpful and absolutely something i would recommend but uh, you know, there are people who never took acting classes. They were in radio or they did local theater and never took actual acting classes to get there. I think it helps you in terms of some of the terminology. It helps you in terms of some of the, the way you flavor what you do and the way, especially if you do on camera acting, it can really help you not get too loud, too brash with your characters you know, understatement is uh, very much an underserved art piece. Um, you know, how you craft the story, uh, it, you know, has so many different brushes and, and colors and so on. And acting can really help. But it's something that you can safely move from the list of things to worry about to the list of things you don't need to worry about. And by the way, when you're an audiobook narrator, whether you've taken acting classes or not, it's too late. You're an actor. You're done. That's it. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're storytelling. You're not, it's not a 30 second story. It's a 30 right. hour story. Right. But it's a, um, it's not a, a 30 hours all at one point, all in one piece. Because even, even people who consume audiobooks, very rarely do they consume the whole book in one sitting. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it can be looked at as a series. Like people think, oh my God, a 10 hour audiobook. I had probably to sit there for a hundred hours and record stuff. And, you know, if you're doing it wrong, sure, that's what you had to do. But usually what you're doing is a half an hour, an hour, maybe an hour and a half at a time. And with our system, with, with my system, then editing that chapter, giving your voice a rest, you know, and then if you want to, doing it again. I mean, you get 60 days to do audiobooks on ACX. That's like, if even if it was, even if it was a 60 hour book, you know, Jerusalem by Simon Vance, you know, a huge undertaking. It's an hour a day. And it's usually not, it's usually like five hours or 10 hours. And so when you look at it as a series of small repeated processes that don't require the the fortitude, the 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 uh you know the the strength to to go on, to soldier on, you know, it that's not the way it's approached. And I find it to be really joyful. So yeah, anyway. Now when you're and when you're doing then this is just like coming out of my head um you've got a book i just finished a book um last night 
And there were so many characters in this book. Um, I read the Kindle version. It was not an audio version book, but I was, you know, knowing that we were talking to you today, mm -hmm. I was wondering, it because there is an audible version of it, how do you keep all of those characters consistent from beginning to end when you've got to bring them back so many times? Or in another book in the series. Right. Right. So there's a number of tools that you can use if it really gets a thicket. You know, uh, I use Positron for both proofing and for my character management. But again, I can tell you that um, the words do the heavy lifting. Each character has their own way of going about things. Where it gets really hairy is with science fiction. Because you have no idea how to pronounce their names. You don't know what language they're using. You don't know what their whole... What, what would a Gazinthian uh, be if they were uh, depressed? Who knows? On the planet of Gazinthia, you know, maybe depression is a really happy thing. I don't know. But, you know, um, I, I think that these things tend to work themselves out organically or technically. You can work them out. Positron lets you create a list of characters. You can even put in a uh, an audio sample of that character so you can remind yourself if you want to, if you can't remember. I've never had a situation come up that I can recall where uh, I got the characters confused or mixed up once I started into the story because everybody has their motivations. And again, as you approach this as an actor, you know, nobody's going to get Picard confused with Geordi. Oh. And so, well, my mom might. Um, you know, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And, um, there are tools that can help you, but usually you don't need the help. Okay. Even, and, and I wonder, I wonder what that number is for you. How many characters did you think was, oh my God, huge? Uh, and maybe it was just the writer's style. She had thrown so many characters. Um, it was a murder. Like, give me crime. a number. Just an estimate. Probably 15. Yeah. So 15 is pretty standard. Okay. And, you know, there are books where there are, you know, dozens and dozens of characters, some of whom you don't even know are important or not until the end of the story, you know? And, you know, the the, the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest lesson I learned when I first started doing audiobooks was don't wait till the end of the story to find out that your your main character, as he's dying, has a rough Irish brogue. So Jen just wrote that question on the side. She's like, what if you do if you get halfway through the book and you realize the character you've been voicing is supposed to be a Southern Belle? Yeah. So we, we teach our students uh, how to create a welcome kit that we send off to uh, our rights holders. And we ask them for character uh, profiles as well. So you have that going in, as well as you prepping the book to a degree that isn't densely reading for pleasure, but reading for potholes. So there's a couple of checkpoints along the way where you get to know the characters and you get to know what's going on and you don't make those mistakes. But it's just one of those cool things that we learn how to do. And you can do it too. What do you do if you find that the book is poorly written? You don't do the book. And that's one of the reasons that, again, we teach this process and the order of things. Like if you're approached about doing a book, one of the things that you do before making the decision, before deciding whether it's going to be a union book or even a right a, a per finished hour or whatever, is you read the manuscript. You ask for the full manuscript. You don't just audition for it. Um, the, the process can be, depending upon whether it's an offer or an audition, um, but but reading the manuscript comes before the decision to take the book. And it's amazing. It's one of the scams that you watch for. There's a really well-written audition piece. And then the book was like, where did this come from? You know, the, the world of chat GPT. And um, yeah, so, so you make that decision long before you, and, and you also avoid the whole notion of, oh, I can help them. You know, I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll fix him. You know, is are you listening in Jay? Are you listening? I was going to say, do you, you want to pop in here? What happened? You can't edit for people. Oh, she, she'll get really terrible. She had one that she was like trying to edit. Terrible, terrible. It was terrible. It was short. It was brief. 
but it was first of all it was an essay nobody cares about this it wasn't a book it was an essay and it oh my gosh like just it's and it's and just yeah. all the things and it and it wasn't justified like the formatting i was like it was just shake shaking shaking yeah, yeah. anyway it happens and <laughs> one of the things that we teach in the acx master class is a number of supplemental uh services that you can offer uh number one with some nonfiction uh and with some fiction books you can create a related pdf uh so if there's images or maps or charts in the book that are germane to the story, but you can't narrate, often what will happen is the rights holder will create a PDF that if you go into your Audible library, you might see a little link for a PDF off to the side of the title of one of your books, and you download that and it gives you uh, a, a PDF of, of related images. And you refer to those in the narration. We talk about in the process of audiobookifying a book, which has become a thing in the last five or 10 years. Um, you change words like, as you're reading this book to as you're listening to this audiobook, or you watch for positional references like uh, under the image below or on page 46, because that doesn't exist. Um, and, and so there's things that you can do uh, as services, even just reading the book out loud, if authors don't read their book out loud to themselves, they won't find all of the typos that they think they've found. And with audiobook narrators, we're constantly feeding back to our rights holders, hey, by the way, you're missing a word here in this sentence. Because you don't see them. You, you know, I had a rights holder who just cried. He goes, you have no idea how much money I paid to have this book proofed. And look what you found. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your master course is can be a really great option for people who are interested in getting started in audiobooks, or maybe they're like us and they're like, eh, I don't really think they're for me because I have these fears. Where can people learn more um, about they, where they can get it? And we can put that in the show notes since we're running up on the end of our time here. Sure. So uh, acxmasterclass.com is where you want to go. And uh, currently this week, uh, we're we're doing a series of free lessons that talk about all this, the myths okay. around audiobooks, the technical requirements, the tools. Um, and then next week, we're going to open up registration for our 10th anniversary edition of the ACX Masterclass. It's our 21st. We do it twice a year. And um, so acxmasterclass.com and right there at the top of that front page, you'll see looking for the free lessons, click here, and it'll take you right to the free lessons. Um, right. And we're also watching comments below those free lessons. So if you have further questions, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question here today, or you're watching a replay, um, you know, just, you know, pop a comment under there and, and I'm watching and watching what's going on. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I recommend people check that out and we are going to transition. We've already made it to an hour. So David, thank you so much for joining us. You've been a wealth of information. I feel, I already feel a little more empowered to go back into my audiobook. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to record at least two chapters today. I'm going to just swallow that elephant one bite at a time. Right. That's but it. Be before you go, we like to ask our guests just three, just for fun questions. And our first one is, what show or series are you binge watching right now or do you recommend? So I'm re-watching Ted Lasso and I'm re-watching Welcome to Wrexham. I don't know what happened to me in the last few years, but all of a sudden a sport that bored me to tears, football, soccer, uh, is now like my thing. Uh, and I'm a season ticket holder for the Los Angeles Rams. So I'm a football, you know, American football, huge American football fan, but I'm binge watching that. And I'm also uh, 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 binge watching, um, the hell's the name of it? The Bear. The Bear. So, uh, yeah. And, I, you know, I, I hate that there's such a long list of shows that I've heard of and have never even, you know, wandered over to find out what the plot was. It's just such a glut of of stuff that I'd like to be able to do. Well, it sounds like you've picked some good ones. Um, what is your dream vacation? Uh, my dream vacation is laying on the beach opposite Scout Hat Island, 
which is an island uh, within the the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, oh. It's between uh, Cairns and uh, Port Fort du uh, Port Douglas. It's it's completely isolated and it's completely pristine blue green. It's gorgeous. The island actually does look like a, a an old timey scout hat, and just you know just soak up the sun. I love it. I feel that way about Cape Lookout on the North Carolina coast. You have to take a ferry there. There's no stores. There's nothing but a, a the lighthouse and a ranger station on the whole island. And the it's... emptiest of the empty East Coast. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's great. It. Um, okay, last question. What's your go-to shower singing or car singing song? Uh, I, do I have a go-to song? I mean, if it isn't uh, The Wheels on the Bus Go Round and Round, I don't know what that might be, but uh, you know, I'm, I never was a button pusher, you know, now it's a paddle on your, your steering wheel. It used to be hit the, hit the mechanical button on your radio when a commercial came on. Cause I wanted to hear the commercials. Right. I wanted to hear the DJs, but now I am now I'm like, I've got 10 presets on my car and it's like, my middle finger is the most, you know, and it's not just middle finger toward the radio. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, going to the next channel in my seek. And it's like, and I, and I turn to my girlfriend, I go, do you like this song? No. Okay, great. Click, you know, and then, yeah. So, um, but when, uh, Stevie wonders, um, uh, any song by Stevie wonder, I don't care when that comes on. If you pull up next to me, I don't care what you think. You're jamming out. I am Go absolutely jam or earth, wind and fire. Clearly yeah. I grew up as a child of the seventies. So <laughs> I love it. Well, a huge thank you to everyone who joined us live today. Uh, if you're listening to our podcast, feel free to join us live on YouTube every Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Meanwhile, be sure to connect with each of us on LinkedIn and join the VO Booth Besties Facebook group. If you missed a live episode, you can always catch the recording later on our website, boothbesties.com, or anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. We would love it if you would hop on any platform and leave us a review. Those reviews help us reach more listeners who are looking for great voiceover content. Uh, once again, make sure you're signed up for the VO Booth Besties newsletter so you know what's coming up in the week ahead. Join us next week uh, at a special day in time with Frank Verderosa. We're going to talk all things sound engineering, but because, you know, he works all day, <laughs> we'll, we have to kind of find a break. And so make sure um, you check the Facebook group and uh, also follow us, subscribe on YouTube. So you'll know when that interview is going to happen. So thanks again, David, and we'll see you guys later. Have a great